Chapter One of the Young Pretenders. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Celine Major. The Young Pretenders by Edith Henrietta Fowler. Chapter One In the Garden. Granny would never come back any more. At least, that was what Nurse said and so the children knew that it must be true when we're grown up shall we know everything right like nana does asked babs as they talked it over afterwards in the garden i dare say answered teddy carelessly what shall we play at now babs so the children forgot the news that nurse had told them and cheerfully accepted the fact that their grandmother with whom they had lived during the whole of their short lives had gone away indeed beyond recall it did not matter much to them they had always thought of granny as a piece of the drawing-room furniture quite a nice piece but dull and delicate as most drawing-room furniture is to the child mind she had never entered into their world at all that was peopled by a host of pretending folk all the animals they ever came across and most of the servants with their relatives and acquaintances inclusive such an interesting world it was bounded by the brook and the lanes and full of excitement in the first bird's nest and the young rabbits to say nothing of giles the gardener's thrilling stories and besides it was several weeks now since granny had gone away to london and the memory of her was already growing a little dim teddy and babs had both almost cried their eyes out when don the retriever died but then he was a real friend of theirs and that makes a great difference good morning little master and missy said giles as the two children peeped in at the tool-house door has nurse told you the sad news no what cried babs anxiously suit hasn't been caught in a trap again has she and the little girl's face paled with apprehension i mean about your poor dear grandma oh is that all said babs with a sigh of relief you give me such a fright about darling suit nana told us granny isn't never coming home again answered teddy but giles do take us to see the nest you found yesterday yes do pleaded babs sakes alive ejaculated the old man what callous creatures children be and he drew his horny hand across his eyes and finished the plant he was potting before they all three started for the plantation the children dancing round him with the delight of a couple of terriers just turned out of the kennel teddy said babs when their excitement about the nest had abated and the gardener gone back to his work if that other big nest right up at the top of the tree that giles told us about is so high what no ladders can reach it how did anybody reach to put the eggs in this was rather a poser for teddy but that was the worst of babs she was always asking such difficult questions and teddy deep down in his masculine mind could not bear to own that he did not know i spect somebody climbed he said dubiously oh who asked his sister eagerly it couldn't have been giles nor nana nor granny nor that gardener's boy cause i asked him specially if he couldn't get me one of the eggs for our collection and he said it was much too high who could it be somebody in the night perhaps a fairy perhaps an angel oh yes surmised babs that must be it one of those i specked out of four corners to my bed yes said teddy thankful that the subject was satisfactorily settled on their way down you know what shall we play at now continued the little girl let's pretend we're the stoners mr and mrs stoner were a very erratic couple whose varied experiences were bab's great delight she was always mrs stoner the fond mother of a most dilapidated family of dolls and a cheery chatty matron notwithstanding all her cares and teddy was mr stoner at least he always began by being mr stoner and then to bab's sorrow he generally turned out to be either a prince in disguise or a terrifyingly wicked man called henry baker it was naturally very upsetting for mrs stoner when either of these changes took place and indeed on one memorable occasion her husband had suddenly become a lion which was manifestly perturbing in any well-regulated household 
poor babs used to implore teddy not to turn out into anybody else but he was rather a romantic boy and enjoyed the unexpected moreover he had one great advantage over babs which influenced his style of play he being seven years old could read exciting fairy tales and work out his pretenses on those lines while his little sister being only five was out of all this for such sentences as that fat cat which were at present her literary boundaries did not tend to inspire fresh thoughts or ideals don't turn out to be any one else pleaded babs be just mr stoner i can't be sure said teddy solemnly well then to begin by being the prince i'd rather have that than turning out but in the end as usual babs played teddy's way and mrs stoner opened proceedings by giving a sumptuous dinner-party her only guests were snapdragons chosen as most suitable for banquets on account of their swallowing capabilities it was such fun poking down their open throats with a bit of stick first some chopped grass out of the mower's wheelbarrow mixed with water and then a soiled pudding made from the hostess's own receipt what shall we do now their throats is full asked babs anxiously before the last course i'll be the doctor said teddy do people ever have the doctor right in the middle of the dinner party they might if they were very ill rap 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 on the trunk of the tree and mrs stoner flushed and excited admitted dr teddy and then they had a lovely time peering into the snapdragon's throats and pouring water down and in extreme cases extracting the tongues from the back of the flower it's just like us when we had sore throats cried babs excitedly by the time the doctoring was done some of the snapdragons were very languid and weak they don't open their mouths quite so nice said anxious mrs stoner stroking them tenderly with her fat brown fingers they're very bad still pronounced the doctor gravely and this dear white one is all split then it must be drowned continued the medical man whose measures were drastic oh teddy gasped the little girl sympathetically must it really yes we will go down to the brook with it now so the tender little hostess bowed to the doctor's stern decree and they set out across the field towards the brook with fatal purpose let me kiss it afore it goes asked babs as they stood on the bridge and then after sad farewells they solemnly dropped the ragged flower into the water a moment's mournful silence ensued let's paddle suggested teddy chiefly to cheer babs drooping spirits at the snapdragon's decease the thought of wading into the cool water on that hot morning filled the little girl with a sudden reaction of delight they tore off their shoes and stockings and ran about on the fresh grass before venturing into the brook i still mrs stoner said babs i'm henry baker announced teddy the worst had happened for there was nothing which filled poor babs with greater terror than the sudden appearances of henry baker oh please not teddy she gasped be a prince instead henry baker is a wicked man said teddy utterly unmoved by her appeal he cut all his children up in slices the horror of this announcement was too much for babs in her hurry to reach dry land she dropped her little bunch of petticoats and frock trod on a sharp stone and finally fell down in the soft red mud that lined the banks of the brook what a mess observed teddy unsympathetically babs looked extremely surprised for a few moments and then as if to complete the catastrophe she began to splash violently with both hands you'd better come out continued teddy as his sister sat resignedly in water several inches deep and then from a scientific point of view what does it feel like babs rather cold in the water and warmish in the mud catching her breath anything like hasty pudding would be yes something only kite cold hasty pudding more like porridge perhaps oh yes cried babs cheering up just like porridge and lots of cold milk you'd better go in repeated teddy cause of catching cold it's a horrid feeling said babs as she scrambled up all heavy and dripping it's harder catching cold and stopping all day in bed observed teddy wisely 
and his little sister took the hint and started to run towards the house as fast as she could in her wet clinging clothes nana was a lovely nurse to go to in a mess she never scolded at all but put babs into a nice warm bath and dressed her in clean dry things only muttering to herself every now and then poor lambs gone to-day and here again to-morrow which remark babs did not understand at all and that cannot be wondered at for to whom could it possibly apply the children were not gone to-day and granny who was would not be here again to-morrow or indeed as nana had said ever again still it seemed to relieve nurse's feelings and that was the principal thing one of the undermaids had ventured to laugh at this saying of nana's that same morning but had been sternly rebuked for making jokes when death was in the house it ain't in the house anyway she rudely retorted it's in the family and that's the same thing said nurse with dignity as she left the room nana always spelt the family with a capital f now miss babs dear when the toilet was completed you'd better not go out again just at present wait till after dinner there's a love ordinarily this prohibition would have raised a storm but the little girl astonished nurse by saying all right as she ran off into the day nursery it's as if the dear lamb's thoughts were in heaven too said nana wiping away a tear but she was mistaken the dear lamb was thinking solely of some very interesting bird's eggs which she and teddy were trying to hatch on the top of the hot water cistern and for some time she had been trying to persuade him to let her make a hole in one of them with a pin just to see how they were getting on but in vain this seemed a golden opportunity for the children were nearly always together so bab started off to the attics armed with a large pin to aid her research the egg is addled teddy she announced at dinner how do you know asked her brother sharply i made just a teeny weeny hole in one with a pin and i couldn't see nothing you'd no business to said teddy crossly now you've spoilt that one i told you not oh teddy i haven't killed the little bird she asked in an agony yes you have here nurse had to interfere as babs was almost in tears and teddy quite in a temper if there's any quarrelling about it i shall have to throw the whole lot away she threatened and the children were drawn together again by the bond of a common danger to their beloved property four years ago major and mrs conway went back to india leaving their two children to live in the dear old country home with granny she did not know much about children poor old lady or perhaps she had forgotten what she once knew it was so long since the major and his younger brother were little boys in the cloverdale nursery and that dear dead daughter of hers a baby girl and besides she had latterly become a regular invalid and could not do with the noise of childish voices and rough games so teddy and babs had lived alone going their own way and working out their own thoughts nana was very good in caring for their creature comforts but she was rather old and fumbling too and they had never known the joy of an undernurse one of those scatter-brained jovial village girls who work so badly and play so splendidly so the children's chief and only playfellow had been the gardener giles all day every day unless the weather was too bad they spent out of doors playing their quaint games and pretenses and growing with the birds and flowers in nature's big nursery quite independently of the training and teaching which children usually have a happy sunshiny life it was and cloverdale the best biggest home country in the world but with just the same surroundings the two children were entirely different different in looks and ways and character and it seemed as if there were a mistake somewhere that teddy should have been the girl and babs the boy for teddy had a sweet fair face framed in golden hair his lovely mother's face in fact that ought to have been her daughter's and babs poor babs was dark and square and sunburnt a plain cheerful child full of the tenderest sensibilities consumed by the most ardent feelings while teddy smiled an angel's smile and did not care much really about anything i will conjure this afternoon announced the little boy magnanimously and babs delighted excitement knew no bounds the conjuring pigs were quite an institution in the cloverdale nursery 
they originally came out of a noah's ark which granny had given teddy one far-away christmas and consequently were both exactly alike where will you conjure to asked babs with the deepest interest i will conjure this one into the wheelbarrow on the lawn hidden in the grass said teddy with a lordly air look here it is in my hand you see it and touch it yes said his little sister in an awe-stricken manner at the approach of so great a mystery well look here be gone pig one two three and away and he waved his closed hand wildly in the air now babs go to the wheelbarrow and see if it's there away flew little barbara downstairs and out at the garden door she buried both her fat hands into the mown grass and sure enough there lay a little wooden pig oh teddy she screamed here it is how wonderful you conjure how do you do it but her brother never would tell he enjoyed her wondering admiration of his skill and proceeded to electrify her still further by conjuring the pig back into the nursery cupboard again she implored i thought of a place this time into the rabbit hutch but teddy said the conjuring was over for that day and babs could not persuade him further so they took all the young rabbits out in the orchard and played with them happily till tea-time when nana arrived with the joyful announcement that they might have tea in the little tea-things on the lawn a slight squabble arose as to who should pour out which was decided by a compromise suggested by nurse babs should help the milk and sugar and teddy pour the tea tea in the little tea-things always ended with a delightful game called lapity which consisted of a race between the children as to who could first drink a whole cup of milk spooning it up with one of the tiny teaspoons it was very exciting as babs in her hurry generally choked and then teddy got so far ahead that he was sure to win on this occasion it ended more roughly still the teapot was upset and the tray swam with a miscellany of slops which flew at teddy finally insisted that babs should drink the little girl obediently complied she was accustomed from earliest youth to drink the leavings of a little tea-things party and had apparently quite acquired the taste uncle charlie's coming to see us soon said teddy giles told me oh how lovely cried babs we haven't never seen him all our lives have we of course not he's been in india as well as father but he came home when granny went to london he'll be splendid won't he teddy a real injust soldier a very favorite game of the children's was pretending to be father and uncle charlie i'm awful glad he's really coming continued the boy cause he's been in a proper battle you know babs giles told me all about it and got a medal from the queen cause of it oh yes i know giles tells us lovely tales about uncle charlie i shall be a soldier too babs of course of course but teddy i wish father had been in a battle too it makes it so much more of a soldier he might have got killed suggested teddy oh so he might i'm awful glad now it was uncle charlie as was in the battle and i am his medal'll look lovely on his scarlet coat won't it babs oh lovely when's he coming i'm so sighted bout it one day quite soon giles says master teddy master teddy called nana from the window i want you the children rushed in and found nurse poring over a little thin piece of pink paper which had come in an orange envelope i'm to take you up to london to-morrow master teddy dear your uncle says what does it say asked teddy who could not quite manage to read writing yet bring the boy here to-morrow for funeral by eleven train to paddington we'll meet you captain conway not me too cried babs with a dawning fear no dearie said nana lovingly but we'll only be gone a day or two oh i would so have joyed the funeral cried babs why didn't they want me too there there miss dearie don't fret funerals aren't nice for little girls which sounded as if nurse thought them delightful for every one else i wish i was going too continued babs wailing 
but nana came to the rescue with kisses of comfort and suggested that the little girl should sail boats during her bath and this was a stroke of genius on the part of nurse bab's distress vanished as if by magic and judging from the shouts of laughter and splashing which emerged from the bathroom during her ablutions the trouble was apparently quite forgotten for happily children's sorrows though perhaps as keen as those of their elders are nothing like so long lived teddy was not nearly so excitable as his little sister and took the news of his coming journey very calmly he methodically set about packing his best top and paint box in case he wanted either of them at the funeral and nurse attended to such details as clothes after the children were safe in bed they both sat up till nearly eight o'clock on this memorable occasion and babs was spared the anguish of that half hour which usually came after her bedtime and before her brothers teddy she called the last thing just before nana shut the night nursery door s'pose the eggs hatch while you're away what must i give them to eat bread and milk said teddy and just a few worms mixed with it you remember how our last starting but one joyed bread and milk and worms now children no more talking or i shall have to shut master teddy's bedroom door i's rather glad after all that i'll be home in case those eggs do hatch murmured babs to herself it would be so lonesome for the little ones without me for their mother and the dear little mother's soul within her rejoiced that no pleasure of hers should interfere with her loving maternal duties which is the way of mothers End of chapter one chapter two of the young pretenders by edith henrietta fowler this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two uncle charlie but teddy and nana did not come back again soon four five long summer days went by and babs was still alone at cloverdale she was enjoying herself immensely it was such a treat going down to tea in the servants hall such fun helping giles all day to garden and listening to his thrilling conversation uncle charlie was the never-failing theme giles waxed so eloquent on the heroic conduct of british soldiers and babs caught his spirit and tone in a manner which even indulgent nana would have noticed and rebuked at last a letter came to cook telling her to prepare for captain conway who was coming down to cloverdale that very night it was very tiresome that he would not arrive till long after babs was asleep but on the following morning directly she knew that he had gone downstairs she rushed into the dining-room in ecstatic anticipation of her introduction to this heroic soldier uncle a slight fair young man sat at the table pouring out a cup of tea where's my soldier uncle asked babs aghast with an anxious little quaver in her voice i want to see him good gracious is that really the girl thought captain conway as he looked at the sturdy brown little maiden before him and looked in vain for some likeness to that lovely stately woman who was his brother's wife i want my uncle charlie she repeated impatiently you can go away strange man but look here child i am your uncle charlie don't you know me how could she have known him when he had been in india for the whole five years of her short life but he could not think of anything else to say this first appearance of his niece had so greatly disconcerted him the boy was so pretty and graceful and taking that both his uncle and aunt were delighted with him and captain conway had vaguely expected that when he went to cloverdale a trim-looking maid would have brought to him a well-dressed golden-haired fairy kind of child who would have kissed him prettily and lisped out some polite orthodox greeting instead of which the door had been flung open and transfixed at the sight of him a square brown plain untidy little creature had stood on the threshold impatiently demanding that he should go away and that her uncle charlie should come i am your uncle charlie then as if to himself imagine this being barbara's child to his great surprise the little girl stamped her foot in a sudden frenzy of passion go away nasty strange man she repeated they told me my uncle was a soldier and i's not a barbara child they calls me babs it is all right i am a soldier he said soothingly and i have come all this way from london to see you i thought you'd be exactly like this 
she explained drawing nearer and the smart young officer looked with amazement on a hideous advertisement for recruits which portrayed a red-cheeked soldier blowing a trumpet and giles always says as the british soldier is the pride of the nation and i was so glad my uncle was one and now you are quite different not a bit like a pride of the nation and no sword nor medal nor nothing and she looked at him reproachfully never mind about that exclaimed her uncle i'm not dressed like a soldier to-day i've got lots of scarlet coats and swords in london and you shall see them all if you will be good bab's face brightened at this cheering news and a trumpet and shield she asked eagerly yes yes everything answered the captain with a slight disregard of the truth and in the hope of diverting her who is giles i love giles said babs forgetting her disappointment he is teddy's and my best friend next to nana you see granny was generally ill giles said she's got the chronic and since teddy and nana went to london i've lived in the garden and gone about with giles more'n ever and we've had the loveliest talks about you and the crops and when the old pig'll be ready for killing and i weed and dig and help giles all day let me go now continued the child pulling away from his hand i shall just catch him while he's feeding the fowls so that is the girl thought the captain a vexed look sweeping over his face what a pity but this running wild and being the companion of some farm labourer must be put a stop to it is most unfortunate she is not a bit like a gentleman's child either to look at or to talk to fat brown legs covered with scratches filthy hands hair that looks as if it had never been brushed or cut frog fit for the workhouse accent atrocious manners and education entirely lacking so the fastidious dandified captain reckoned up his small niece's enormities and resolved that things should be very differently managed now the children were under his control for captain conway and mrs conway had decided to take teddy and babs home with them to london and keep them until their parents came back from india to settle in the old home at cloverdale i've explained to giles about your being not a bit like a soldier to look at said babs on her return to the room a few minutes later and he says as elders and betters must be honoured in spite o their looks which as they didn't make themselves is no fault of theirn babs exclaimed her uncle you really must not talk like that it's not at all like a little lady the brown eyes filled with tears and an ominous pucker round the mouth caused captain conway to add hurriedly there there don't cry here's a new shilling for you babs brightened up in a moment and took the peace offering with delight i've never had so much money in my life afore she said excitedly i never have nothing but pennies except the three penny bits on sunday which giles says take as natural to the off tory bags as ducklings do to duck ponds captain conway sighed but babs went on cheerfully i'd like to see you in your scarlet coat soon with your spear and shield do you often kill people now uncle charlie no not often laughed the young man only wicked people i suppose not anybody at all babs looked woefully disappointed until a fresh thought suddenly diverted her may i crack your egg for you do let me i can do it so nice as her uncle was afraid of vexing her again he resignedly acquiesced there's always a chance in finding a chicken in it you see she continued that's what makes eggs so interesting for breakfast we only have them on sundays so we only get very few chances have you got any real chickens out of doors oh yes splendid ones all the bantams are mine and the others teddy's i'm afraid you are very fond of the country said her uncle trying to picture this wild out-of-door child shut up in a london nursery what are you afraid of in the country she asked the cows i'm not a bit afraid of them and i milk the dear white ones sometimes when giles holds her tail i can't bear it to come whisking round and have you got any dogs or cats why of course we have i love suit the cat better than any one in the whole world except teddy and nana and giles and father and mother in india she hasn't had any more kittens lately 
it seems a longer time than generally is since she had any poor thing her kittens hardly ever live to grow up but giles says that cats have a sight of trouble in that way and what dogs oh sheepy and toby and dash dear don died last week or perhaps it was last year i forget mrs forrester give us toby who is mrs forrester don't you know why jane's aunt the laundry maid you know she lives in the village and her niece lizabeth lamb lives with her who has got the decline mrs forrester give a party the day after nana and teddy went to london and i went and jane and giles i did joy myself giles wore his sunday coat and mrs forrester only cried twice does mrs forrester often cry asked the captain who could not help being amused by this torrent of talk oh generally you know she has to every time she sees mr forrester's funeral card what's framed and you can't help seeing it pretty often cause of its being over the chimney-piece it gives her a turn she always says but giles thinks her reservoirs leak then seeing him put his cup down she added hurriedly do you want some more tea now let me pour it please you can pour the cream in the teapot is too hot and too heavy i saw a pillow-case in the garden this morning continued babs when the new tea was ready a what a pillow-case you know what crawls i don't understand you what was it like her uncle could not imagine what she meant it was brown and furry and creepy like a velvet worm you mean a caterpillar oh yes that's it i knew there was a pillow in it somewhere on wet days i see black snails too mrs forrester wants lizabeth lamb to swallow black snails for her decline but she won't never she's right there laughed the captain now you've finished your breakfast shall we go out asked babs confidingly slipping her hand into her uncle's i can show you the garden you know all right only bring me a match first but captain conway could not get over his little niece's personal appearance he had always felt so sure that barbara's daughter would be a beauty and both he and his pretty empty-headed wife had been influenced in their idea of taking the children to live with them for a while by such poor thin thoughts as these a lovely well-dressed little girl seated beside her aunt in the victoria a sweet gentle plaything for dull afternoons a striking little couple to introduce into children's parties the boy was the heir so his appearance did not matter much still it was a great pleasure to find him so handsome and taking but the girl silly aunt eleanor was quite looking forward to showing off her pretty little niece to taking her out with her and dressing her exquisitely and captain conway was thinking of all this when he looked at babs he was young and silly also accustomed to talk by the hour about a woman's points and the fit of her frock and how she looked and walked and rode and danced and he too had never imagined such a catastrophe as a plain relation his mother had been a beauty his wife was one of course his sister-in-law was really lovely and his niece she who was to take the place which a little daughter of his own would have filled was quite the plainest most common-looking child he had ever noticed at least so he decided in his impatient disappointment her shrill quaint talk was certainly amusing now in the cloverdale garden but her uncle shuddered at the thought of giles or elizabeth lamb and her decline being mentioned with that accent in the onslow square drawing-room a governess must be immediately procured can you read he asked suddenly a question suggested by the idea of the governess babs was lying flat on her face in the grass trying to see down a mole-hole only a bit she answered adding gaily teddy can kite well and he makes poetry too splendid poetry shall i tell you his best piece by all means said the captain lighting another cigarette babs folded her grimy fingers and repeated the following remarkable verse let's learn latin voce safe learn it quickly as you can and he dashed the sparkling water at the feet of mary ann isn't that a splendid one the captain laughed what do you mean by voce safe he asked 
he's teddy's favourite man in church don't you know what we sing about he comes near the end of a rather long singin and teddy and i always listen out for him but he's teddy's favourite mine in church is harry luja but he only comes sometimes do you like going to church oh yes all cept the beseeches but i made a piece of poetry too only it's not such a nice one it's there was a little girl and she had a yellow frock and she had a pella lock that's a very nice one said uncle charlie only i don't quite know what a pella lock is babs looked rather doubtful a lock is what's in the doors you see and my little mary's cover them your little what my little mary's i call them they're rather like wooden people and the key pushes them aside i kiss them often this is a most remarkable specimen thought the captain as babs rushed off in pursuit of a butterfly i never heard such a rigmarole in my life they must be most extraordinary children but there captain conway showed his ignorance of children teddy and babs only thought and talked and lived as thousands of other imaginative children do in the happy interesting world of pretense uncle charlie had made the mistake in thinking that the children would be big dolls so of course he was astonished to find that they were really little men and women babs he called sitting down on a garden seat would you like me to take you to teddy in london and to see your aunt eleanor the sooner she's in a civilized atmosphere the better he thought to himself but apparently babs did not hear him she was dancing excitedly round and round a small object on the path and screaming my catter my catter with a great delight uncle charlie perceived that she had again met with her friend the caterpillar babs he repeated would you like me to take you to london oh yes cried the child diverted directly i want to go to london awful much child has told me all about it well we'll go to-morrow one of the housemaids can take you but you said you'd take me so i will but you'd go in another carriage you see how funny laughed babs who will there be more in one carriage it'll be a nice surprise for nana and teddy when i come i like you uncle charlie much better than i did at first she continued earnestly though you see you are rather appointment to me when i expected a fat soldier with a trumpet but giles says use is second nature and i guess we got used to each other was i appointment to you uncle charlie suppose i expected a fair little girl with golden hair and blue eyes said the captain reverting to his late vision oh uncle charlie did you really she cried and there was a pathos in her tone that drowned the provincial accent and caused her uncle to kiss her hurriedly and suggest a visit to giles to tell him of her journey to london which happily diverted babs for the moment but alas the created thought lived on in the child's soul the next morning all was bustle and confusion quite a new experience to babs the servants kept kissing her whenever they met her instead of telling her not to bother and after she had gone old giles tears fell fast on the geranium plant which he was trying to pot babs could not understand why every one at cloverdale made such a sudden fuss about her she was only going to london just to find teddy and her aunt eleanor she had no idea that the dear old home was to be shut up and nearly all the servants sent away until that far away unreal father and mother of hers came back from india and nobody quite knew when that would be take care of the eggs be sure she said the last thing as the servants stood waving their hands and the final piece of luggage was being put on to the carriage and if the little birds come while i'm away be very kind to them and don't punish them even if they do wrong good-bye dear giles good-bye thank heaven that is over without a storm of tears thought uncle charlie with a sigh of relief as he watched babs pointing out to a wretched little dutch doll all the beauties of the scenery on the road with the brightest possible face what a mercy she doesn't mind about going i was afraid she would have fretted awfully it did not strike uncle charlie that she did not understand that she was really leaving her old home for a time and that as a child she was incapable of looking beyond the near horizon of the hour the immediate interests of first the drive to the station 
and then the long railway journey entirely filled her mind the excitement of sandwiches in the train and then of waking after a long sleep still to find herself rushing along through the country drove all thoughts of the home left behind out of her head she could not remember much about the journey after to tell teddy it left a confusion of impressions which she could not disentangle she was rather sleepy too when they at last left the train and she took little notice of the drive through the streets to onslow square nana and teddy were in the hall of the strange house and the old nurse snatched up her darling and carried her straight off upstairs such a long long way up to a funny small nursery where nice bread and milk was ready and a cosy cot beside nana's bed aunt eleanor was out just then and it was too high up for her to go to the nursery afterwards to see her new little niece you had better know the worst at once nora said her husband as they sat down to dinner that night she is an awfully plain rough wild little creature not half as nicely behaved as the boy i can't believe she's barbara's child oh what a pity i don't like any children much and i detest rough naughty ones we must get a governess at once that silly old nurse spoils them frightfully i can see she's a clever little thing though she kept me amused the whole of yesterday clever worse and worse charlie i do hate a clever plain girl more than i can tell you oh i do wish she had been a doll i've told such a lot of people about the little niece that i'm going to have and now i shall be ashamed to show her from what you say yes you will i'm afraid but she can live in a nursery good gracious yes i shan't bother with her if she'd been like barbara now i would have taken her about with me and it would have been fun to have dressed her i like the look of a pretty little girl in a victoria people would have thought she was my own who saw us driving do i look old enough charlie to have a daughter of five rather not but really i am sorry about the child though it can't be helped it is still more vexing for ned and barbara than for us we'd better have the child photographed and send it out to them to break it to them gently and poor little babs was dreaming of the big bright home behind her utterly unconscious of the new narrow life which she was to live in the sunless atmosphere of her uncle and aunt's selfish life End of chapter two chapter three of the young pretenders by edith henrietta fowler this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three in london london isn't nearly as big as the country said babs one day pressing her nose flat against the window how do you know asked teddy by looking of course at home we could see the garden then the field and the woods and the hills ever so far away what was generally bluish and here you just see nothing but the streets and there's no far away at all i like london said teddy cause you see soldiers sometimes and it's fun driving in the park i've never drived in the park yet announced babs rather mournfully and i don't like always going walks and wearing gloves gloves are horrid agreed her brother and aunt eleanor says i must always wear them very sadly and it's so hot my fingers is all sticky and tighten them there seems more children in london than the country teddy thought but we don't never play with them i asked aunt eleanor if i mightn't play with some of them in kensington gardens and she said certainly not or i'd catch something what asked teddy she didn't say but it seems a pity not to play when there are such lots of children now miss babs dear called nana come and have your things on and we'll go for a walk ways is coming too Wace was aunt eleanor's maid babs was a very different-looking child now to what she used to be at cloverdale no comfortable dirty pinafore was allowed in london but a clean white frock with a wide black sash thin shiny shoes and silk stockings instead of the old thick boots and cotton socks and a big hat trimmed very smartly on the top of her well-brushed hair but aunt eleanor still thought her woefully plain and took far more notice of pretty teddy who looked charming in his new sailor suits let's go up to the park said teddy as they started out oh yes cried babs enthusiastically cause we might see the soldiers 
soldiers are one of the few things in london that really attract the attention of children in the country they noticed almost everything they see but in london probably the mass of objects prevent most of them from being individualized and children walk along apparently unconscious of the vast stream of traffic the army of horses the endless number of people a thousand objects in fact that line one's way through london every now and then they noticed a really interesting thing such as a watering cart or a barrel organ especially if crowned by a monkey or above all things the ordinary london cat that is always exciting whether asleep on the area steps or peeping through the railings or taking a constitutional walk or chatting with a neighbour a child will never pass by a cat without seeing it feeling a personal interest in it and probably hanging behind on the nurse's hand to get a last look at so dear a feline friend teddy and babs were no exception to the rule they walked up queen's gate and saw hardly anything therein a man mending a lamp-post at last attracted teddy's attention and he and babs suddenly developed an interest in lamp-posts do you think he's the man that turns out the london gas in the morning said babs oh i would like to ask him come along miss babs dear called nurse just then they saw a really very entertaining thing a sparrow flying along with a huge straw in its mouth which instantly produced in babs a perfect frenzy of delight oh look look she cried nana waste do look at that dear little bird what has got the straw i specs he's going to build a nest like the birds do in the country where do you think he lives somewhere quite near miss babs said waste very likely in that tree do you think he's the one i hear chirping in the mornings asked the child bless her little heart ejaculated nurse poor nana found london rather tiring after the peaceful rest of cloverdale and moreover she was always longing for the big garden for the children to play in squares indeed she had scornfully observed they be but poor shoddy imitations of real gardens teddy and babs were talking about the sparrow when waste called their attention excitedly look miss babs and master teddy there is the prince of wales teddy looked hurriedly at a passing omnibus and babs straight up in the air as if she were hoping to see the princess in a balloon by the time their attention was properly directed they succeeded in catching sight of the back of a far distant carriage and were not suitably impressed then they crossed over into the park and teddy and babs began to run teddy was a soldier on a horse one of those dear ones that the lifeguards ride his black trousers carried out that idea and his hat on one side made a splendid soldier and babs was a train it must have been warm work rushing about in the sun on a broiling june day in addition to keeping up a perpetual puffing and blowing but that was of course necessary to the idea of the train by and by the sound of distant music and gleam of far-off colour intimated that the soldiers were really coming up queen's gate on their way back to the knightsbridge barracks shrieks of delight from babs attracted the amused attention of several passers-by how lovely they was she said when the show was over i like the soldiers better than anything in london of course i do agreed teddy uncle charlie is not so much of a soldier as we fought is he teddy i've never seen him like one yet you forget his medal babs i suppose so but when a man's never a thing you forget what he really is said the little girl lucidly he is going to a regimental dinner to-night and he will wear his soldier things i like soldiers what fights better than those that only go out to dinner i like both kinds said teddy who had a well-regulated masculine mind let's find things suggested babs and that was a game which never fell flat such wonderful treasures they found in kensington gardens a broken bit of shell on the pathway the outside of a horse chestnut under the trees a piece of fancy grass that was growing and a hundred other things which none but children's eyes would have noticed and which would have brought pleasure to none but children's souls the morning was gone in no time and babs and teddy were surprised when nana said it was time to go home to dinner and there a new treat awaited them a lady had written to ask aunt eleanor to bring the children to a garden party she was giving that afternoon 
will you be good if i take you her aunt asked babs there was generally a gritty sound in aunt eleanor's voice when she spoke to her little niece she was always irritated with the child for not being pretty and she never tried to understand babs eager original nature she did not mean to be actually unkind only she was utterly ignorant of how great a depth of sympathy and knowledge is needed by those who have the care of little children oh i will be good i promise said babs excitedly i won't do nothing at all naughty very well now go and tell nurse to dress you in your very best at four o'clock they started in the carriage to the children's keen delight babs chattered unceasingly do you think they remembers to feed all the omnibus horses she asked oh look teddy as that old man getting up that omnibus he minds me so much of giles don't point babs said her aunt sharply that is not behaving at all well i'm so sorry i didn't know said babs with a cloud over her bright face but how do you make people see things if you don't point aunt eleanor could not bear the trouble of answering children's questions do be quiet a bit she said testily and a ten-second silence ensued wace's young man used to conduct in an omnibus began the little girl again but he left to better himself what an awful child she is thought aunt eleanor i wish i had only brought teddy but babs was quite unconscious of her crimes happily the drive soon came to an end and directly they were safe inside the garden aunt eleanor forgot all about the children and went off with several friends whom she had not seen during the whole dreary month in which she had been obliged to mourn for her husband's mother teddy too behaved rather shabbily to babs the hostess brought two little boys to play with him and after staring at each other for a while after the manner of children the bigger of the two observed come on and teddy went leaving his sister alone on the terrace but babs was a dear sunny little soul who was wont to make the best of everything and though her childish spirit sank at the sad experience of not being a big boy like teddy she soon cheered up and began to talk to a nice lady with a kind face who had seen the baby tragedy and was full of sympathy for the little girl would you like some strawberries dear she asked and bab's face brightened wonderfully as she slipped her hand into that of her new friend i've never been to a real grown-up party afore she said confidingly cause we lived in a country always i expect you like the country better than london said the lady i likes them both but the country is my favourite you see in london i have to wear gloves and it matters about not being pretty i never knowed in the country that i wasn't the lady looked quite sad all in a minute and babs thought there were tears in her eyes where's your mother dear she asked gently in india she's coming home soon i've never seen my mother nor father and teddy has forgotten them but nana remembers them i'm so glad she is coming said the lady i used to live in the country too but that was a long time ago when you was in your last place suggested babs the lady laughed yes darling she said and now tell me if your little brother is kind to you oh yes we always play together unless and her face clouded over again unless there's any bigger children what makes me too little you'll be bigger some day you know it'll never be no good continued babs mournfully cause when i's seven he'll be nine never mind that have some more strawberries or a piece of cake i aren't messing at all are i asked the little girl anxiously cause i promised aunt eleanor i'd be good you are very good dear said the lady yesterday was a bad day for uncle charlie began babs when the cake was finished and she had gone with her new friend for a walk round the garden his best shirts were messed in the wash teddy and i was playing after tea and he was so happy in the passage when all of a sudden uncle charlie came out of his dressing-room with a crumpled shirt and he was so angry as angry as as a lion what has missed a person here is a swing said the lady smiling at these domestic revelations would you like to get on it oh yes screamed babs to whom the swing was a dear country sight i'll swing you said the lady oh no don't touch me i can do it all right we had a swing at cloverdale look 
as the swing began to move in obedience to her extreme efforts i are quite a little acrobat the lady laughed again you are indeed she said but you will get so hot let me swing you now so babs had a lovely swing i are joying myself she said in a glad little voice is your country home very far away asked her friend oh yes thousands of miles there was a stone in the road what said one hundred and ninety-five miles to london would that mean this london do you think yes dear well it was all that far away we'll go home again some day when father and mother in india come if there's a train to take us there will certainly be a train the lady assured her just then a young man joined them how are you mrs allison i didn't know you were here and what a very nice person you have got to talk to she is quite splendid then to babs this gentleman likes little girls only pretty ones asked babs pathetically only fat happy funny ones said the young man just like you <laughs> that's a good thing laughed babs i are quite fat and shall i show you what makes me happy yes do what is it babs turned out her tiny pocket it contained a clean pocket handkerchief and a small paper parcel she opened the paper and proudly displayed what was apparently a bit of meat it's the tip of a tongue she explained teddy and i got one for luck you know cook give it to us and sometimes i carry it and sometimes he does it brought us the soldiers this morning and a party this afternoon one tip lasts about a fortnight but if you wear cotton frocks you have to be very careful to remember to take it out of your pocket afore it's sent to the wash that's a good superstition said the young man to the lady and then they both laughed you're a rum little creature he said to babs will any one be wanting you dear asked the lady i think we had better go back to the terrace oh yes perhaps aunt eleanor and teddy is the party over in a doleful tone well it is nearly i am going home now and i am added the young man good gracious child where have you been exclaimed aunt eleanor impatiently and then seeing mrs allison i hope my little niece hasn't been boring you oh no said the lady i like her and as aunt eleanor hurried away with the children mrs allison said to the young man aunt eleanor would have bored me to death in five minutes but that nice little niece of hers never good-bye kind lady said babs running back and holding up her face for a kiss i hope i'll see you every day good-bye called the young man what is your name you never told me curdie shouted babs as her aunt called her for mrs conway's carriage stopped the way a most ordinary thing happened to me began the little girl as they drove off a gentleman spoke to me what i did not know he asked me my name but i thought i had better not tell him so i said curdie how silly you are said aunt eleanor were those two nice little boys to teddy midlin answered teddy they're going to school soon when am i going to school auntie when you know a little more a governess is coming for you and babs on monday and then we shall see how you get on shall i go to eton school like those other boys i expect so but your father will decide when he comes home what'll i do when teddy goes to school asked babs with a dawning fear but nobody took the trouble to answer her teddy was thinking of the new world of school and aunt eleanor was nodding to a friend when they reached home it was almost the children's bedtime but they were so anxious to see uncle charlie dressed in his soldier things that they were allowed to stay downstairs aunt eleanor put on a tea-gown and threw herself down on the sofa i feel wretchedly ill she exclaimed petulantly these hot days give me such a headache do you think you'll get better or die asked babs with interest she is the most unfeeling child i ever saw thought her aunt but aloud she said snappishly of course i shall get better i'm so glad just then a telegram was brought in asking mrs conway to dine with some people in a friendly way and go with them to their box at the opera afterwards the headache vanished as if by magic 
she poor pleasure-loving soul was only sick of stopping at home and she rushed upstairs to dress in the greatest delight uncle charley came down first and the children danced round him in a perfect ecstasy how lovely you look cried babs a regular pride o the nation and your medal on too said teddy why don't you wear it always a handsome said their uncle to the butler while babs was stroking his sleeve and kissing his sword good night little people patting their heads uncle charley always treated the children as if they were dogs not prize ones of course but nice commonplace dogs who occasionally were brought out of their kennels for a treat i likes uncle charley better than aunt eleanor said babs as the hansom drove away and i do agreed teddy cause he's a soldier and kinder added the little girl oh this last remark had reference to their aunt whom they now saw in evening dress for the first time she had not been to a party since they came besides they were always in bed before her dinner time she really did look beautiful the jetted black dress showed off the fairness of her complexion and diamonds flashed in her golden hair you're as lovely as a fairy said teddy admiringly or an angel aunt eleanor kissed him and looked pleased how splendid you do look exclaimed babs after a deep-drawn breath giles always said uncle charley had married one as would be more for ornament than use and you are aren't you her aunt's pretty face quite changed how often am i to forbid you to repeat that odious old giles chatter she said angrily for the exact reproduction of the old gardener's accent was most offensive to her fastidious ears and besides the vulgar truth of his saying was hardly palatable the child's bright happy look faded it was rather a sad little babs that waved her good-night from the window sad thoughts had begun to come to the little girl in this new life of hers she knew she continually vexed her aunt and yet at the same time she was unconscious of any wrong she read the impatience of aunt eleanor's tone and the disapprobation of her glance in the midst of the merriest play and exceeding bitter once was her cry all the little girls are pretty cept me after she had seen her aunt lavishing admiration and petting on lady evelie's golden-haired doll-faced children and yet she bore no grudge against aunt eleanor nor yet against teddy whom both uncle and aunt so obviously preferred few people who saw this commonplace sturdy little maiden would have guessed the depth and beauty of her fair child soul End of chapter three Chapter Four of the Young Pretenders by Edith Henrietta Fowler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Nursery Life. It was very different playing in the London nursery, far away up so many stairs, and shut in even from the interests of the landing by a little wooden gate that Teddy could not open, much less Babs, to having the big old house and glorious garden at Cloverdale all to themselves. There were no delightful corners in this stiff straight room wherein the children could crouch and bump their heads and enjoy themselves in a hundred enchanting imaginary ways no beautiful cupboards in which to hide nor sofa arms to ride upon as there were in the dear old nursery at home but the children accepted the existing as the inevitable in which they were wiser than some of their elders and made the best of their new cramped quarters if there isn't room enough for hare and hounds there is for giving a party said babs brightly will you give one or shall i teddy i will answered teddy only we must ask nana for things to eat you might live in the night nursery suggested babs and then i could come to the party quite proper and you wouldn't know what there was to eat till you arrived said teddy that's like a real party it's a bit dull for me while you is getting it ready complained babs couldn't i pretend i was your cook just till it was ready for the party to arrive would you forget you knew and be very surprised asked teddy doubtfully oh i would i promise pleaded babs so she was allowed to assist in the preparation of the great feast the pity of it was that they could not go down into the kitchen here as they would have done at cloverdale to coax really splendid eatables such as a handful of currants and a piece of candied peel out of the good-natured old cook they had to be content with what nana would give them 
but it was a lovely feast all the same in spite of rather a scarceness of provisions it was laid out in a little dinner set belonging to babs instead of the usual tea set because as teddy said the things we've got to eat are more dinnery than tea-ish two glass decanters were filled with water tinged pink by the introduction of a little tooth powder of which the mixture babs was very proud it makes a splendid wine she screamed clapping her hands two cough lozenges made a show at one end of the table and a piece of licorice cut up with the scissors out of nana's work-basket at the other a dish of brown sugar well moistened with warm water made an attractive sweet but the crowning glory of the feast was a pile of camphor pills borrowed from nana on the understanding that neither of the children would eat them babs could not resist just touching one with her tongue but it very quickly dried again and nana never knew good morning captain teddy said the little visitor pleasantly on her admission she looked quite gorgeous in a nightcap of nana's and an antimacassar over her shoulders good morning mrs babs solemnly replied teddy who had a black corked moustache and whiskers how do you do and how are your children continued the lady vivaciously quite well thank you ma'am and how are yours teddy was never so good at originating conversation as babs one of them is dead answered the visitor cheerfully her head came off this morning when i dropped her i have brought my best daughter with me you see and she displayed with pride her last new doll take a seat said teddy in a gruff voice bab sat down at the table which was not a table at all but the lower half of her high chair which unscrewed in the middle and the feast began the cough lozenges taste of having a cold i don't like them said bab forgetting her party manners it is very rude to say so observed teddy looking rather cross oh i beg your pardon exclaimed babs who never wished to vex her brother she would have said i sorry if she had not been mrs babs out at a party teddy was carving the licorice and did not reply you ought to say granted like mrs forrester used said the little girl it's manners the visitor oughtn't to tell the gentleman that's giving the party what to say argued teddy babs hastily changed the subject dear captain teddy she said in a funny grave voice might i trouble you for another help of that delicious sugar slop peace was instantly restored and the feast finished without another hitch the tooth powder wine is a little bitter teddy observed on his own account but he drained the last drop manfully the london nursery did quite nicely too for playing rabbits in we was always wild rabbits at cloverdale but we can be tame ones here like our own ones in the pen at home suggested babs and so pretending to be rabbits would not have been spoiled at all if nana had not mentioned the fact that bab's black silk stockings would wear out at the knees and then aunt eleanor was very cross and forbade any more creeping on hands and knees that was a dire disappointment to bab's because creeping was so much nicer and more interesting than just dull walking properly to make up kind nana sometimes let them play rabbits at night in bed where they could creep and burrow and it was altogether delightful but the chief game which the children played in london was that of the toy people they could not continue the stoner romance at all well in such a small room and besides the stoners had stayed at cloverdale so they turned their pretending life into that of the toy people who lived for the most part in big houses built on the ottoman and had themselves all originally sprung from sundry noah's arks there were four great families of them the reds the yellows the browns and the blues and each family consisted of a big mr and mrs who were the grandparents a little mr and mrs who were the parents and such children as the remainder of the noah's ark supplied of course the families were not at all intact for instance big mrs yellow had found an early grave down a grating in the cloverdale garden from which there was no possibility of rescue and little mrs brown had met with a violent death in the jaws of don the retriever a very awkward thing too had happened to one of the young yellows babs dropped him by mistake into the bath and when the water was wiped off him the yellow came off too so he became an outcast from his family and took a situation as white the footman in a distinguished family called violet which belonged to teddy not of noah's ark origin were these but out of a most aristocratic toy box the violets had figures and features of their own and were consequently called lord and lady by the admiring children 
it was rather a sore point with babs that teddy insisted on doing for the violets and darley it seemed so cheerless to the little girl to be thus shut out of their stately home occasionally the original families were broken up and a coalition household formed but the most popular game was in the varied fortunes of the four families themselves bab's favorite person was a dear grown-up daughter of the yellows aged sixteen and the child loved that thin bit of painted wood called annie yellow with a love that her mother was hungry for away in india on weekdays the toy children all attended a school kept by big mr brown and on sundays teddy built a beautiful church and babs had splendid fun making dicky blue behave badly or laying little mrs red low with a sudden and dangerous complaint called the rheumatic sterics one day a terrible thing happened when the children were putting away the toy people jane red was missing high and low they searched but in vain i can't sleep for thinking of poor jane said babs after she had been in bed about three minutes never mind dearie said nana soothingly we'll find her to-morrow all right so bab's sleepless night of anxiety came to an end before nana went to her supper though the little girl's first thought in the morning was for the missing toy maiden and sad to relate the nursery maiden sweeping had found the unhappy jane under the ottoman with her head severed from her body she's quite dead said bab sadly we must have a funeral then suggested teddy and this exciting idea instantly raised bab's spirits the coal-box was selected as a suitable tomb and thither the defunct jane was solemnly borne wrapped up in a bit of newspaper as an appropriate dirge teddy sang rosalie the prairie flower bab's joining in where she knew the words when the excitement of the obsequies had abated teddy still further rejoiced bab's soul by intimating that the red family must go into mourning and after a little coaxing nurse lent them a pen and ink with which they proceeded to make a black girdle round all the principal reds and their collaterals i'm glad jane was killed announced heartless teddy the pen and ink proved so enthralling oh teddy exclaimed babs reproachfully how can you but still now she is dead all this busyness keeps us from fretting but i'm afraid alice blue will miss her very bad they always were friends i know said teddy solemnly perhaps alice might have mourning too suggested babs brightly when the reds were all dry that was a very happy thought and teddy delighted his little sister's soul by allowing her to do alice all by herself which resulted in a few blots and stains on frock and hands but an amount of bliss which far outweighed such trifles i think it ud be nice for the reds to have another child to make up for poor jane observed babs regarding the stricken family on the table and i've got a thought teddy what is it asked her brother you know white the violet's footman mightn't we dip him in the red ink what's in the library and make him a new son for little mr and mrs red do you think uncle charlie would let us aunt eleanor wouldn't but uncle charlie might if we asked him as a great treat anyhow we can try said teddy and hand in hand the solemn little couple trotted down the long staircase and gently knocked at the library door uncle charlie was yawning just then he had finished smoking at least as much as he ever finished and his letters were written and there were no books to read that is no yellow backs which were uncle charlie's idea of books and it was raining and there was a whole hour to get through before he went down to the club he was just wondering whatever he could do to amuse himself when the children's rap attracted his attention it was a most propitious moment for teddy and babs what do you want youngsters uncle charlie asked smiling oh please they began in one breath and then babs finished might we dip the footman in your red ink uncle charlie looked amused what do you mean he asked it's like this continued babs earnestly and their funny sober faces made uncle charlie laugh the reds have lost their daughter jane what died under the ottoman in the night and we think a new grown-up sound would cheer them up poor things yes poor things chimed in teddy i'll tell the rest babs so we want you please to let us dip white the violet's footman in your red ink do let us yes do dear uncle pleaded babs and then he'll make a very nice young red all right said uncle charlie only perhaps i'd better dip him 
oh yes screamed the children how kind you are i like you very much exclaimed babs dancing about in her excitement so the little white wooden man was made a bright red and uncle charlie delighted the children still further by inking him a nose mouth and eyes shall i give him a moustache he asked i don't think sons ever have moustaches said babs doubtfully only uncles and fathers he's quite the handsomest of all the toy people now observed teddy looking admiringly at his uncle's handiwork he's the only one with a mouth piped in babs oh thank you so much dear uncle yes thanks awfully said teddy and then as uncle charlie had nothing else to do he played with the children for a little and made them a paper boat out of a sheet of writing paper and a tiny cocked hat you's awful clever said his little niece admiringly i don't think there's another man in london which is so clever and so kind uncle charley was quite pleased with their devotion i'm glad we make the children so happy he thought to himself i must tell ned about them when i write it will please him and barbara the next time there was a catastrophe among the toy people and barry brown's hat was licked white by the dog of course the children knew where to go to have it set right uncle charley will do it for us said teddy confidently oh yes agreed babs he will be sure to do it i'm glad we've got an uncle what is so kind it makes there always a help for things we will go now and get it done said teddy and he and his little sister tore downstairs and hardly waited for an answer to their rap before they rushed into the library we've brought barry began babs but then she saw that uncle charlie who was leaning back in a chair was scowling dreadfully now then you youngsters clear out of here and look sharp about it he said angrily what's the matter gasped the little girl do you hear what i say how dare you stand there staring when i have told you to go be off at once and don't come bothering down here again the children rushed upstairs in a panic they could not know that some very persistent tradesman had insisted on immediate payment of their bills and uncle charlie had ordered them out of the house in a fury being ready to vent his superfluous anger on the first objects that turned up which unfortunately were poor little babs and teddy what was we naughty about asked babs breathlessly i expect it was going downstairs without being sent for teddy thought but we went the other day and uncle charlie wasn't a bit angry that does make it puzzling answered teddy doubtfully if it had been aunt eleanor i shouldn't have been prized said babs sadly but uncle charlie what used to be so kind he isn't kind now observed teddy don't you think he ever will be again he may grown-ups often change you know i hopes uncle charlie will but i should be too frightened to go down again to see and i should do you think mother and father in india will be at all like uncle charlie and aunt eleanor asked babs a little anxiously i expect so said teddy gloomily i don't think i likes fathers and mothers and uncles and aunts whimpered babs it was much nicer in the country with just giles and all the lambs and chickens and things i's tired of london poor little people it was so easy to make the sun shine in the nursery and cross selfish uncle charlie had hidden it all away with this ugly thundercloud and then he went down to the club and forgot all about it end of chapter four chapter five of the young pretenders by edith henrietta fowler this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five about lessons the new governess had come and lessons were quite a fresh experience for teddy and babs nana used to teach teddy to read and write and babs had learned a little of both too but on the whole they were very ignorant children for seven and five years old miss grimston was a real old-fashioned governess very prim and proper and particular thoroughly imbued with that most absurd of dying theories that children should be seen and not heard just as if their fresh original chatter were not one of the most delightful things to be found in life and the expression of their quaint baby thoughts one of the most entertaining 
moreover she laboured under the delusion that it is better to drag out and punish all the current naughtiness of the nursery than just simply and quietly to look the other way to extract continuous confessions of unreal sorrow for unrepented of deeds instead of diverting the child's thoughts and feelings into another better channel and letting well alone when you have done so miss grimston was an excellent person conscientious down to the heels of her little flat boots and invaluable in carrying out any work which she undertook provided it was not the education of children for which she was utterly unfitted it is strange that though people are very particular not to select grooms who know nothing about horses it does not seem to occur to them that an equally careful selection should be made concerning the trainers of their children and nobody chosen for that work who does not truly understand the mysteries of child life but it was hardly surprising that uncle charlie and aunt eleanor should not have regard to this for they themselves did not know that there was anything in children to understand and when miss grimston arrived weighted with testimonials they were only too glad to secure her services and hand over babs and teddy at once into her keeping but the children did not take to miss grimston they disliked her stiff severe manner and shrank from her grey granite nature she's not very nice said babs solemnly to teddy and her hands is all loose bones what might rattle i don't think i like her much nor i don't agreed her brother she won't be able to play one bit and i know she'll scold i wish some wild beasts would eat her all up he added fervently babs looked very serious until the last happy suggestion perhaps they will she exclaimed cheerfully anyhow we can hope it the nursery had been turned into a schoolroom and poor nana sent with tears in her eyes to sit in the maid's room with wace good morning children gasped mrs grimston breathless from her mount up the long flight of stairs good morning they answered gravely from a distance children generally know by instinct whom it is safe to kiss come near and shake hands nicely continued the governess i don't think i'd like to shake hands with you said babs your fingers is so bony miss grimston looked severer than ever you are a very rude little girl she said sternly but perhaps she thought it better not to press the matter teddy was soon settled with a copy to write and miss grimston brought out a child's guide to knowledge with which to educate babs after reading over a few questions and answers several times during which process babs sat with a wondering look on her bright little face miss grimston decided that the lesson had been sufficiently learned stand with your hands behind you barbara she said why asked babs surprised she had never done such a thing in her sensible out-of-door life before and she did not see any reason in doing so now perhaps on the whole babs was right because i tell you to that is enough for little girls babs looked puzzled for a minute and then a sudden light illuminated her face are i going to do nastics she said with a little laugh miss grimston took no notice of her question but turned to the open book my dear child are there not many things that you would like to know oh yes screamed the little girl delightedly i would like to know what makes there come such lot of colours in the water bottles and why the crumbs jump up when we slaps the table and be quiet barbara said the governess angrily but you asked me exclaimed babs bewildered by the rebuke you were saying your lesson remember the answer is yes yes please i suppose interrupted the little girl miss grimston returned to the book pray then what is bread made of dough and barm replied babs promptly i've often seen cook make bread at gloverdale teddy and i used to each have a piece to make little men with bead eyes what grew fat in the baking silence cried the governess in despair that is not the right answer isn't bread made of dough and barm in london it always is in the country i know the answer is flour what were you thinking of barbara when i read this lesson to you babs looked doubtful for a minute i was thinking about what makes you have so many more bones in your hand than other people's she said candidly be quiet barbara how dare you be so rude am i rude i didn't know but you is so funny continued the little girl you keep asking questions and when i answers them you say be quiet 
you are a very naughty pert little girl and i shall put you in the corner what's that asked babs with interest hitherto she had been quite ignorant of nursery penalties go and stand in that corner with your face to the wall babs cheerfully complied what happens now she asked a minute afterwards you will remain there until you are good i's like a cow it's in a stall laughed babs teddy i's pretendin i's dear flossy we've never played this game afore be silent barbara cried miss grimston in the last stage of irritation it is not a game at all it is a disgrace babs then began to make a sort of gentle munching sound and occasionally shook out the ends of her sash that's flossy's tail whisking she murmured quite content the exhausted governess now turned her attention to teddy's copy-book and to her dismay perceived a number of black lines covering the whole page what is this she asked severely you told me to cover with ink the lines that were made and then to copy them i like covering the lines best so i left the letters till last miss grimston looked at teddy he had such a sweet innocent face that he could not really have meant to be naughty it did not occur to the governess that an angel face may be coupled with a boy's soul and besides she had already decided that babs was the naughty one the little girl had been so rude and obstinate while teddy seemed so gentle and polite so after a mild rebuke she turned over a new leaf and watched for a while his laborious attempts to copy the printed writing and certainly teddy was not so actively naughty in school time as babs he was so much less intense than his sister in all his feelings that this was really the result of idleness rather than of excessive virtue poor babs was always in trouble of some kind and the sad part of it was that it all came without her meaning to be naughty at all things so often turn out nasty she said wistfully to teddy but this was how it happened miss grimston had a strict theory that school time must be kept rigidly and no irrelevant talking or laughter allowed therein and bab's nature and habit were always to talk and generally to laugh she thought of so many things to say and her words tumbled out before she remembered it was school time and also such lots of funny things happened that she could not help laughing at them miss grimston's pen might give a scratch or better still the slate pencil a squeal and the little girl would break out into the merriest laughter she really could not help it for it was so splendidly funny when a book fell down or miss grimston knocked her knuckles against the piano or teddy dropped his pocket-handkerchief she had always laughed out of the fullness of her cheery little heart and how could she be changed all in a week to suit miss grimston's fifty-year-old fads but of course babs did not see all this she only knew that she was always being scolded and punished for doing what was to her the most natural thing in the world and really how could she help it bad reports of her conduct were continually being sent downstairs and aunt eleanor said it was just what she expected but uncle charlie only laughed miss grimston's battles with babs amused him vastly one of the most serious bones of contention between the little girl and her governess was the weekly letter to her father or mother in india babs had been accustomed to printing in wild crooked letters a few disjointed quaintly spelled sentences entirely out of her own head and her mother was wont to laugh and cry over these dear funny little letters which generally ended in a lot of kisses and scribbling all of which babs felt sure her mother would understand as well as she did but with miss grimston came a new order of things she insisted on proper letters written in a large round hand and saying such things as she thought fit or sometimes pencilled underneath and babs who saw the impropriety of this style of correspondence rebelled if you say the things it is your letter she argued one thursday morning while teddy was peacefully plodding through miss grimston's copy on the slate he was glad to be saved the trouble of making it all up for himself do not be so troublesome barbara said the governess grimly i aren't troublesome answered babs only i do want to send mother a letter of my very own what do you wish to say severely i can't tell you really miss grimston and why not pray it wouldn't be at all polite cause you see i want to tell mother about you miss grimston's face became very sultry your mother would not read such a naughty rude letter she remarked sternly 
and with a remarkable disregard of truth yes she would contradicted babs flushing with temper and she would like it much burn your dirty old letters defiantly i shall not allow you to write at all unless you behave yourself and come at once and ink over this pencil copy which i have done for you miss grimston stooped to lift babs on to her high chair but the child stiffened in every limb which is a sure sign of infant depravity and uttered a piercing tearless yell you are an exceedingly naughty little girl said the governess angrily and i shall not allow you now to write at all i shall send a note instead to your mother to tell her how naughty you are babs began to cry violently and sat screaming on the floor while miss grimston fulfilled her threat and teddy after the manner of children took absolutely no notice whatever of the storm of tears cease that noise at once barbara said the governess as she looked over teddy's dull little letter but here again babs had neither the power nor the inclination to obey it would have been a physical impossibility for her to suddenly swallow down all her woe miss grimston picked her up with a vicious little shake do you hear me cease crying this moment she repeated and babs spirit rose within her get away you 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 beast she cried passionately a chill horror fell upon the room miss grimston's bony fingers relaxed their hold and she solemnly rang the bell for nurse put miss barbara to bed at once she said in an awful voice when nana appeared and she is to remain there in disgrace for the rest of the day i shall inform captain and mrs conway of her outrageous conduct myself nana was only too glad to carry her darling away from the governess and the dreaded dominion of lessons and she hushed and soothed the sobbing child though she dared not disregard the command to put babs to bed my letter wailed babs i only wanted to write to mother and tell her how horrid miss grimston is and now she'll write and tell her i've rageous conduct like uncle charlie and aunt eleanor and nobody won't understand you shall write yourself lovey said nurse soothingly and nana'll put it in the post and it'll be all right the thought of the letter wonderfully cheered babs and the sorrows of the morning were quite forgotten in the excitement of writing it that afternoon she sat up in bed in her little red dressing-gown with flushed cheeks and very bright eager eyes it shall be a very long one and nana you must tell me when i can't spell the things quite right that i will miss babs dear said nurse lovingly called her a beast did she bravo laughed uncle charlie after miss grimston had gone home in a whirlwind of righteous wrath what a lark aunt eleanor laughed too she is an old cat i must say but really babs is an awful child i shall be thankful when ned and barbara come home and then the remembrance that teddy was in the room playing by himself in the back drawing-room changed the conversation uncle charlie and aunt eleanor aren't a bit angry with you about miss grimston said teddy cheerfully as he had tea a cosy tea prepared by nana on a little table beside bab's bed they both laughed and uncle charlie called you a lark and aunt eleanor said miss grimston was a cat and uncle seemed rather glad you'd called her a beast did he really i thought it was dreadful naughty but aunt eleanor said you were an awful child i know that's cause i'm not pretty do you think mother will mind about me not being pretty too i don't know did you write mother a long letter oh yes a splendid one what told her all about it barbara said miss grimston sternly on the following morning are you prepared to apologize for your unseemly insult of yesterday what do you say are i what asked babs somewhat puzzled are you sorry for speaking to me as you did yesterday oh yes said babs eagerly for children never bear malice i are very sorry and to-day i are quite good i am glad to hear it said the governess thawing a little and i hope you will never be such a wicked child again uncle charlie didn't think it at all naughty to call you a beast continued babs pleasantly he seemed rather glad teddy said perhaps he and aunt eleanor don't think beast a rude name i don't spect they can cause aunt eleanor said you were a cat and in course she couldn't be rude but a cat is a beast too isn't it 
Miss Grimston's face became a dull chocolate color. It was her way of blushing, but she did not know what to say. She only felt a feeling of intense irritation against the innocent child. Look over your geography lesson while Teddy says his spelling, she almost hissed. Babs looked surprised. What had made Miss Grimston angry again was a complete wonder to her. She supposed it was one of the inexplicable mysteries of the grown-up. Babs hated geography, but the lesson had one redeeming feature. In due course, Miss Grimston asked what was the capital of Cornwall, and Babs answered with a little shriek of amusement, Bodman on the camel's back. Teddy had been the original perpetrator of this excellent joke, but its repetition brought unfailing delight to Babs. A severe rebuke always followed in its train, but the children resignedly bore that for the sake of the wit. Music lessons, too, were always a sorrow to Babs. Teddy was a musical boy, and caught things by ear, and in fact took as naturally to the piano as a young duck to water, but practicing to Babs was labor and sorrow. Miss Grimston sat beside her and occasionally rapped the fat, stupid little fingers with her spectacle case rather sharply. A note once played wrong was always played wrong in Babs' case. She toiled through the blue bells of Scotland with the greatest effort, and invariably alighted on C instead of E for the bonny note. "'I'm so hot,' she gasped after her sixth try for E. "'Mightn't I rest a bit?' "'Certainly not. Play your scales now.' the thumb wrench or as it might be called the thumb screw in the scales was even more exhausting and babs drew her breath hard in her anxiety to accomplish it i writed to mother all yesterday afternoon began the little girl presently for she had no idea of secrecy there never had been any reason for it in her happy life up till now and i told her all about the beast then you are extremely defiant said miss grimston angrily i specially forbade you the privilege of writing to your parents and i am much displeased at your daring to do so babs bowed her head to the storm but she did not quite understand what her governess was saying teddy she said when lessons were over and miss grimston gone i don't think i'll tell things again to people what don't understand it makes it so nasty i wouldn't answered her brother it's safer not what makes it safer asked babs it never mattered at home giles and nana were different i'm glad i write it to mother she'll be pleased to get such a very long letter but the arrival of that mail in india brought a good deal of anxiety to major and mrs conway oh my poor babs cried her mother do look at what she says ned and then she showed him the funny little printed scrawl dear mother she's dreadful i called her a beast and i wish you'd come home soon your lovin little babs and there's such a horrid letter from that odious governess i know she's unkind to my poor baby oh ned do take me home to them as soon as ever you can and barbara conway covered her little daughter's letter with kisses and when the major took it up the page was all wet what does the boy's letter say oh just a dull schoolroom copy not from teddy at all but done by that woman but i'm sure ned that things are going wrong and i do want to go home so dreadfully it is very good of charlie and eleanor but they know nothing about children and now they've got this horrid governess read her letter and then burn the vile thing so major conway read dear madam i feel it my painful duty to inform you that your daughter barbara is in so insubordinate a frame of mind that she is unfit to write to you her periodical letter to-day and also that her conduct is at times so outrageous that ordinary childish penalties prove utterly inadequate yours truly eliza grimston beast exclaimed his wife thereby echoing her little daughter's sentiments of nearly a month ago End of chapter five